my pleasure to introduce Frank Rothell. Most of you know Frank. He is uh, on the adjunct faculty here. He taught for 40 years at 40 years plus at Nassau Community College. And Frank is the first PhD graduate student uh, out of the Marine Sciences Research uh, Center. So Frank, uh, we all remember you for that. <laughs> We were desperate to have a graduate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wasn't that funny, Kim? <laughs> uh, Frank has done a number of things. He's been uh, all over the world consulting on using secondary materials. Um, he has also served on, for a number of years on the alumni board from Stony Brook University. And, um, He's taught a lot of courses, and I think one of the most bizarre things that he has done in the realm of teaching is that he actually taught courses on the Long Island Railroad at 7 in the morning uh, about physical science. So I can say that Frank knows how to keep an audience away. <laughs> With that, uh, I want to just uh, say that we're interested in hearing about the boathouse. The boathouse physically probably is the largest experiment that has ever taken place at uh, SOMAS. And I think other than Henry's uh, monitoring of the dunes in East Hampton, it may be the longest running experiment. So Frank? I'm Remember that boat, huh? Yeah, I like that. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm sure you're all aware that you know, in life, Tommy is everything. No doubt about it. And this seminar today could not occur on a better day. You see, it was exactly 25 years ago today, October 2nd, 1990, we dedicated this boat house. I mean, we couldn't, George, we couldn't have planned it any better if we wanted to. God only knows we didn't plan it. Okay? So, being that today is like the, the silver anniversary of the Golden House, okay, I thought I would I rename the title of today's seminar. And we're going to call today's seminar an untarnished silver anniversary, okay? I mean, 25 years. This boat house has lasted longer than most marriages. <laughs> so, how did it come about? I mean, where did it come from? If, if you wanted to find out where you came from, you'd probably go like to Ancestry.com and check your lineage. Well, if you did that for the boat house, you'd find out that maybe it's parent, okay? It was a project we did here at Stony Brook called Seawalk. The Coal Waste Artificial Reef Program. And it took place in the late 70s. Jimmy Carter was president, and here in the United States, we were experiencing our first energy crisis. New York State had a number of power plants, electric power plants, that at one time were coal fired. Those plants had been converted over to oil, but now, in the midst of the so called energy crisis, New York State was considering converting them back. The burning coal. They had they still had their infrastructure to do that. But the question became, what are you going to do with the coal ash? And in the 70s, believe it or not, we still used to take a lot of waste out to sea and dispose of it. Okay? Sewage sludge, acid iron waste, all sorts of things were still being dumped in the sea. So the state thought we could maybe take coal ash out and dispose of it in the sea. But there's already regulations proposing that. But we had some pretty unique, you know, forward-thinking faculty here at MSR. So of course, you know, that's Marine Science Research Center, the precursor of SOMAS. And they had the idea if we took this coal ash and we stabilized it into a block and then used these blocks to make an artificial fishing reef. Maybe that was a strategy for utilizing this material. And so we began a program called the, called the Seawalk. And in the summer of 1980, we actually had the governor of the state of New York, Hugh Carey, come down and toss the first stabilized block into the Atlantic Ocean, with the South Shore Long Island. And after that block, we're going to see 
We constructed the largest artificial fishing reef made from stabilized blocks of coal ash in the coastal waters of the United States. A great program. And the reason that program is important is because a component of that program came to the core of my doctoral dissertation. So that's how I got involved in getting, you know, ash under my fingernails. The energy crisis abated. None of the plants converted to coal. Great program. It didn't go anywhere. But in 1983, the New York State Legislature passed a law that's commonly called the Long Island Landfill Law. If you're not familiar with Long Island, if you're, if you're you know, from out of state, you may not be aware that the only drinking water we can get here on Long Island comes from beneath our feet and aquifers. It was in the late 70s that we started looking at how the way we were managing our solid waste might be impacting the quality of our drinking water. And it became pretty evident that the way we were doing things certainly had the potential to contaminate drinking water. So the state legislature passed this legislation, which in essence closed all the landfills on Long Island. After 1990, you would not be allowed to landfill any garbage and trash on Long Island. So no, no more landfills, what are you going to do with it? And some of the towns considered going to what we call waste energy plants, facilities where you could take your garbage and burn the garbage, create heat, and use that heat to generate electricity. Of course, the question became, what do you do with the ash? And I said, hey, I got an idea, okay? <laughs> well, of course, there were no waste energy plants on Long Island. The nearest one was in Westchester County, New York. So we went up there, we took some ash, and we started to look at this material. And much to my surprise, this combustion residual performed so much better than coal ash. So in 85, we started some bench scale testing. And of course, my idea was to mimic what we did in seawall and make some artificial reefs from the material. And so in 1987, we placed our first structures into the city. Okay. One little artificial habitat, I really shouldn't call it a reef, but one habitat made of stabilized coal ash blocks and one control. And that study gained quite a bit of notoriety and not until after we placed those reefs in the sea, EPA came knocking on our door and asked if we put some reefs in for that. And I said, you write me a check and I'll give you a reef. And so they gave us two more reefs in, okay? They had a very specific scope of work they wanted, but by 88 we had four structures in Long Island Sound. And while we were working on Long Island Sound, the current dean of MSRC, Jerry Schubert, would pass me one day, I don't know, in the hall or outside, I really don't remember. And he goes to me, hey, Frank, are those blocks you put into, into Long Island Sound, would they be strong enough to, to build a building with? And I foolishly said, yeah, okay. <laughs> Man, no doubt about it, okay. He said, you know, I've always wanted a boathouse on this campus. And I thought he was joking. But if you knew Jerry Schubel, you knew he didn't joke. And so while we're in the midst of looking at the reefs, we started this program to build a boathouse. Now before we get too into the details of this, we, we need to bring everybody up to speed. Once that legislation was passed, okay, Long Island basically split itself in half. The larger, more densely populated communities elected to go with waste energy plants. East End towns figured it just wasn't cost effective to do that and they wanted to haul the material and truck it off Long Island. And so what developed were four waste energy plants on Long Island. Now some towns went on their own, like Isla, there's a waste energy plant in Isla, and one in Babylon, they were built just to handle those communities' solid waste. But the towns got together. Huntington and Smith Town got together and built one plant to handle their material. And same happened with Hempstead in the town of Hempstead in Nassau County. Brookhaven's right here back to Stony Brooks in Brookhaven. They got together and built one plant. And that little illustration here is the, is the Hempstead plant right over to the middle of a parkway in Nassau County. Full park figure, approximately 5,000 tons per day of garbage and trash go to these four facilities. And that's about half of the garbage and trash Long Island generates. But of course, you combust 5,000 tons a day of trash, you're going to get ash. 
Now, combustion is really pretty effective when it comes to reducing the volume. You burn garbage, there's about a 90% volume reduction. When it comes to reducing the mass, however, it's only 75%. So that means, of course, 25% of what you put into that plant comes out as ash. So for every ton, for every 2,000 pounds of garbage you put into a plant, you'll get 500 tons, uh, 500 pounds of ash. Overall, on Long Island, every year, we produce about 475,000 tons of ash. And since these plants have been operational, we probably now have more than 11 million tons of ash sitting at two sites, one in Brookhaven and one in Battle. Okay, then we're gonna talk a little bit about ash and its characteristics. Let me explain how some of this ash is generated. And it's a crude schematic of a waste energy plant, but they're all pretty much the same. Uh, the garbage trash comes in and goes into a pit. It's then conveyed into a hopper, and it's from this hopper that the garbage trash moves across a grate, and that's where it gets combusted. It gets combusted on these grates, okay? The grates are designed so that by the time the garbage trash is moved to the bottom of the grate, it should be totally combusted. Then that garbage, uh, that ash, basically falls off the grate into a, a big tank of water, a quench tank where it's cooled. This ash here that travels along the grate and falls into the tank, as you might expect, is called grate ash. However, these grates are really not that different from the grates you might have in a fireplace at home. Okay, this space is between them because air is brought up from the bottom through the grates, through the, through the garbage and trash, so, to some full combustion. Well, the spaces in these grates, even though this air passing up, it allows material, ash, to fall through and get to the bottom. And that, well, it's a small amount, that's called sifting's ash. That also is conveyed into that tank of water. Grade ash or sifting's ash is basically considered what we call bottom ash. It comes from the bottom of the plant. And that's about 85% of the combustion residuals these plants produce. The air that's forced up through the material sort of makes a grand tour to the facility, carries with it the finer particles. Okay? These fine particles make this little tour and ultimately end up in a piece of technology called the scrubber. When you burn garbage and trash, you generate acid gases. Of course, you don't want these acid gases to get out to the environment along you know, acid rain. So what we do is we channel these gases into a facility where we spray lime. Lime into the flue gas. The lime reacts with these acid gases and forms, lime is calcium hydroxide. You form either calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, and that material, much of it falls to the bottom of the scrubber and is collected. The residual particles, the really fine stuff, goes into a bag house a big vacuum cleaner, okay? And while the food gases are allowed to pass through the bags, the particles can't, and they're captured. So if you take the ash that comes in the bag house and blend it with the ash that comes in the scrubber, we call that fly ash, about 15%. But there's a big difference in characteristics between bottom ash and fly ash. The bottom ash, of course, is coarser, it's heavier. From a chemical perspective, however, it's pretty much inert. The fly ash, on the other hand, that's where we find a higher concentration of metals that would be of environmental concern. Okay? Metals like mercury, lead, cadmium, they're all enriched on these fly ash particles. The reason for it is the temperatures that are achieved on the grates are so high that these metals volatilize, become gas. And they travel with the flue gases as they make their way to the smokestack. But of course, as they make their way, heat is transferred to the boiler, temperature of the gas cools down, and these metals are not condensed, and they condense onto the particles. So we have not only different
structural characteristics between the two, we have very different chemical characteristics between the two ash types. If we were in Europe, if we were in Asia, we have to keep these two ash types separate. They're not allowed to combine them over there. But here in the United States, we do. We blend the two ash types together, and when you blend it onto the fly, that's both combined ash. Okay? Okay. So when we first started out, okay, we what we took was we took combined ash from this facility in, in uh, Westchester County. And this is what it looks like after you finish processing it. But if you looked at it when it came right out of the plant, it looked totally different. Okay? It's not homogenous at all. You have all sorts of things in it. So what you need to do before you can actually use it in any type of beneficial reuse application is first you have to remove the metal. Now today we have some very sophisticated metal processing facilities in the United States that handle just ash. We're able to take out not only the ferrous metal, we take out the non-ferrous, the light non-ferrous, which is aluminum, but today we have technology that has to take out the heavy non-ferrous, the silver, the gold, the platinum, the stainless steel, brass, bronze, you can get it all out of the system. But in the 1980s, none of that existed, okay? I had to take the ash from this facility and I took it to a sand and gravel pit just east of the University of Long Island. And there we had a, a drum magnet to pull the ferrous out. But that's all we could take out. Technology didn't exist to take out non ferrous in those days. You couldn't even get the aluminum out. But of course, we were able to screen it, take the oversized fraction, crush it, blend it again. Today we have air classifiers that will take out the non ferrous, but in those days we had graduate students that pulled out the non ferrous. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it works! Okay, very successful. And a bit cheaper than an air classifier. Okay. Now, ash, when it comes out of a plant, you can't use it right away. And that's because ash has to sit in age. Okay. Why does it have to age? Well, ash has a tendency to swell. And the reason it swells is that if you look at the chemistry of the ash that comes directly out of a plant, you find that it's mostly metal, metal oxides. Okay. But give it some moisture, like you do when you put it into a, a, a quench tank, and now you form hydroxides and other compounds, that, and they have a tendency to swell. Like size is bigger. An example, a great example, and one of the biggest problems we have with ash is that one of the major characteristics is that if the ash comes out of the scrubber, it's mostly calcium sulfate and hydro. But when it gets moist, there's a mechanism that moves the get hydrate, calcium sulfate, become calcium sulfate hemihydrate, CAS4.1 FHO. You might know that's pledged to Paris. But the reaction doesn't stop there, it goes over to gypsum. Okay, cs 2 h 2 When you look at the, how that molecule expands as you go through this, this transformation, it's not trivial. And that's one, but of a number of these transformations that occur. So ash has to age. You have to allow it to swell. And so we had to let the ash sit around for about a month and a half. And actually, the longer it sits, the better it becomes. But when all is said and done, and you look at the characteristics of the material as we process it, it has the characteristics of a lightweight aggregate. It's a really good mark for lightweight aggregates in the construction industry. Okay, just real briefly talk about the reef because the information we gathered from the reef was really critical in putting together the boathouse. As I mentioned, we created four structures, okay, uh, two at ash and two at natural controls. Okay, we just went out to a cement block plant and we bought cement blocks. Each structure was about, say, 125 to 150 blocks. We examined them for five years. What we did every three months, we dive on these structures, we bring blocks up, we monitor its structural integrity, we look to see if the chemistry of the blocks had changed at all, was trace metal comp composition the same month after month after month. If it was, then you know you weren't leaching anything into the sea. People ask, well, if you're not leaching any seeds, any of the biological community that's growing on the blocks being impacted. And so before we actually took this box away for structural testing, we removed colonies of organisms. This is a colony of hydroids that very frequently, you know, encrusted the blocks. And over the years we actually found no uptake. 
the structures really performed beautifully. Okay, they attracted finfish, crustaceans, things are going well. Uh, lobsters in the summer were great. I remember extracting <laughs> numerous lobsters from the reef and bringing them, you know, home for very personalized bioassay in my backyard. <laughs> I think we use like, you know, a cold bun as an extraction fluid. <laughs> but it worked beautifully. But um, from here came the boathouse. And again, we went back to the waste energy plant in Westchester. Now, the, the, the reefs were all from combined ash. I wasn't even aware of the fact that this facility had the ability to separate their ash streams. But I was already learning pretty quickly that in Europe, bottom ash is the way to go. So we had uh, the ability now to get combined ash and get bottom ash. We wanted to compare the two. Obviously, when you start out any program like this, you start out on a bench scale. And our first question was, well, what's going to be the mix design? So we looked at various ratios of ash to sand to make an aggregate, fault and cement, and then concrete products have to cube. Okay? If you ever poured a concrete patio, you know that if you put concrete down, they tell you to keep it wet. Okay? What gives <clears throat> concrete its strength is the cementitious reactions that take place. They're all hydration reactions, and that connects a kind of slow. All right? You don't test concrete for structural integrity for at least 28 days after it's been you know, fabricated. But you can speed these curing conditions along, and we wanted to look at that. Nobody wants to sit around for 28 days and watch a block get old. Okay? And by changing temperature and humidity and things like that, you can do it. We knew that our goal was 1,000 pounds per square inch. That was the requirement for a building product, 1,000 PSI. So we looked at the mix designs. And we kept playing around with these mixed designs and curing conditions until we consistently get at least a thousand pounds per square inch. Then once we did, we started doing the next phase, which is durability assessments. You know, you can have a strong block, but if it's not durable, if in three months from now it pulls apart, it's useless. So, you know, what impacts the strength of a cement product? Well, number one, you know, people think, you know, weathering, you know, rain and snow and those conditions and yes that, that has some impact on, on materials durability but things like freeze thaw every time a block goes through the winter and it freezes one day and blows out the next you go through these freeze thaw cycles and every time that block freezes and thaws that puts a stress on the cementitious bonds within the, within the block so there are all sorts of durability assessments you want to take you know, and if I remember correctly, uh, meet the ASTM specification, 25 cycles of freeze and thaw in the texture block. And another one is wet dry. You soak a block, you get good and wet, and you let it dry out. And every time you soak it and let it dry out, you know, that has an impact on structural integrity. But we were able to achieve the strength. We had great durability data. We looked at leaching <coughs> to make certain that some of these metals that are associated with the ash would not leach from these blocks as a function of time. And we had all that completed, we settled on two mix designs. For the combined ash blocks, the mix design turned out to be 75% combined ash and 25% sand. That gave us our aggregate mix. For that we added 15% pull and cement, a little bit of moisture, and we made the block. For the bottom ash, we use 65% ash and 35% sand for our, for our aggregate mix. The same amount of cement and the same amount of moisture. And why the difference had nothing to do with, with strength or durability or any of those issues. It had to do with cosmetic looks. The, the bottom ash is coarser. Because it was coarser, if we didn't add more sand, the surface of the block didn't look too good we didn't want that in the boathouse. So we just added the sand to give us a, a better cosmetic appearance. Okay. So before we decided to do the full scale run, we went to a lot plant in, on the south shore of Long Island, the Rasso and Sons and Isle of Terrace, where we had actually fabricated the blocks for the, for the reef. And we did a small run. 
We took 20 tons of bottom ash and 20 tons of, of combined ash. We fabricated whole linear blocks, a couple hundred. But I think before we build this boathouse, we better be damn sure it's going to be okay. So we sent the blocks to Underwriters Laboratory. They get a third party independent assessment of these blocks. UL, they test everything. And they do test cement blocks. So we shipped off all these blocks to UL and told them to run this stuff to where we tested is imaginable. And they did. And the report came back showing that our ash blocks were equal to it. In one case, actually better than a state, it's a met block. I think, okay, we're in pretty good shape. We submitted the permits to the DEC. Nah, had a little discussion there, okay? <laughs> but ultimately, we did get our permit, and we went ahead and we built the building. Now, I haven't noticed that it's a pretty good sized boathouse out there. It's 60 foot by 90 foot. 22 foot vertical walls, okay? It took 14,000 cement blocks to build it. And that's about 350 tons of ash. 350 tons of ash, that's about the amount of ash that's produced in one day, one day, in the garbage and trash in the town of Brooklyn. So we'd have to build an awful lot of boathouses <laughs> to use up this ash. Want to find that out. 
Then he wanted to look at was potential changes in the chemistry of the ash box. I mean, we really, you know, you, you do a study like this, you have to go to public hearings, and you can be assured of the fact that at a public hearing, there's going to be critics of whatever you want to do. Okay? And surely enough, when it came to this study, there were a lot of critics. And one of the things that kept pounding eating me up on was the fact that all my leaching studies, all these tests, were really not valid. That in time, in time, acid rain was going to reduce the alkalinity of the blocks. This reduced reduction in alkalinity was going to lead to mobility of metals. These metals would come out of the block, impact the environment, and I'll be polluting Stony Brook. Okay? They didn't suggest that, but, but we got it pretty badly. Because they, how do you know? How do you know? Do you have data for 25 years? And of course you don't. You have, you know, laboratory assessments, you do your modeling, you know, and but that doesn't fly with a lot of people. So we want to look at that. So structural integrity. We were really fortunate when the construction of the boat house was complete, there were a lot of pots left over. And Cliff Jones, the building manager in those days, was smart enough to, to grab them, okay? And he put them in the outside boat pen. And they've been there for 25 years. <laughs> we actually went and we took a half a dozen of these blocks the other day, well, the other day, back in April. And these blocks are less than perfect. They've been used for 25 years. I mean, you go into the boathouse today and you'll find a vessel <laughs> supported by blocks. I mean, we've used them to support boats. We've used them to support barbecue grills. Okay? <laughs> we, we, we've used them. And because of that, they're less than perfect. I mean, here's one I pulled out of the pen just the other day. Could you turn and the light on so we can see? Well, later on we'll turn the light on. But, but if you look closely, you'll see that this is, the block is blemished. It's got a crack here. It's got a, a gouge down here. And all these imperfections basically lead to reduced structural integrity. So I was a little nervous taking these blocks away to have them tested. So, yeah, I mean, the best thing you want to do is find out if their strengths are not suitable. And uh, we didn't know the composition. I mean, visually, you can't tell it's a bottom air block, it's a combined air block. You can't tell visually. But we took them to Barasso and Sons, the same organization that made the blocks 25 years ago for the boathouse. <coughs> and here's the equipment you use to determine compressive strength. You put your block in between two jaws, you load, you, know, you compress the sample until it fractures. It's, you know, under the protocol, the way you load it, the rate in which you load it, that's all predetermined. This is pretty sophisticated equipment, it's all computerized. And lo and behold, the very first block we break, the pressure strengthens up almost 5,400 PSI. Whoa, not too shabby. We built the boathouse, and we're only 1,350 PSI. 25 years later, we're over 5,000. Well, maybe it was an anomaly, but it wasn't. <coughs> We calculated the compressor strengths, and if you're a lover of the metric system, we have the numeric of Pascal's. We're just shy, the average, we're just shy of 5,000 PSI. That's pretty remarkable. I was pretty excited. But the excitement didn't last long, because I found out that, that, oh, that a lot of things change in 25 years. And so do protocols. You don't determine compressor strength today the way we did it back in 1980, 1990. Back when we built a boat house, the protocol said you take a block, you place a load upon it until it breaks. That gives you your total load. Then you take the gross surface area of the block. The block is 8 by 16, 8 by 16, 128 square inches. Divide the area into the load, you get your compressor strength. Not today, you don't do it that way. Today, you put a load on a block until it fractures, but now you don't use the gross area. You use the net area. As you can see, this hollows in the block. That, re that results in a lower area, lower area, higher strength. So while our numbers are good, they weren't as impressive as we initially thought. So we went back to the original data. We can figure out the net area of the block today as well as we could then. And under the new protocol, the old data, 1,350 pounds per square inch would have been about 2,500 pounds per square inch. So we still doubled 
the compressor strength of the blocks over 25 years, that's pretty substantial. But from my perspective, or interestingly, is the fact that for years people have argued that the chemistry of ash was not uh, was not compatible with long-term durability of concrete. In ash, you'll find constituents in a high concentration, chlorides and sulfates, and those constituents still have a you know potential to reduce structural integrity. Now I knew from my time dealing with the reefs. I mean, we've had concrete and marine systems for set more than a century. And if you're a marine science student, you know that chlorides and sulfates are major constituents in seawater. We don't see marine concrete breaking apart, and that's because we've used a very specialized type of pool of cement, a marine quality pool of cement. And we did that when we put the reefs in. And this marine quality pool of cement is designed to handle chlorides and sulfates. Again, our critics in those days argued, ah, uh, you're, you're way off base, because the concentrations of chlorides and sulfates in ash are so much higher than you would find in seawater. And, you know, we didn't see any deterioration in our reefs. But they argued, well, that was only five years. Wait a while, and this stuff is going to fall apart. Well, I think today we're going to blow that myth right out of the water. When it came to looking at the chemistry of the boathouse, what we did was we actually bored right to a block. <coughs> Moshan, okay, my student, helping project. <laughs> we bored right through, three inch diameter bore. Now, we used five bottom ash blocks that were in the exterior wall and five combined ash blocks that made up the exterior wall of the boathouse. You have one surface of the block that for 25 years, okay, has been exposed to the weather. The rain, the snow, the sleet, and everything else. You bore right through, you'll get a core that's been exposed to the environment. And on the other side, you get a core that's been inside the boathouse for 25 years. Never been exposed to any of those environmental factors. So again, five bottom ash, five combined ash cores. That's what a core looked like. And what we did, we took these cores and we analyzed the cores for their chemical composition. And I'm not going to try to bore you with a, a lot of data, but this is the chemistry, the five cores. We're taken on the outside of the block. This is the side of the block that was you know, exposed to the environment for 25 years. First thing you notice is that the uniformity is pretty good in the numbers. Okay? Yeah, we do have a couple outliers. Uh, we had one hit in lead, 19,000 parts per million, okay? And, and you can expect that in ash. You just get a little piece of lead, okay, in your sample, and it blows the number right out. But on the whole, with the exception of one hit in lead, and another one in nickel, the numbers are pretty consistent. Outside, inside. This is, these are the samples. They never saw any environmental exposure. Now, if you look at the numbers, don't try to make too much sense out of them until you think the means. I guess the means of the five samples, the outside, bottom ash, the inside. We did the same for combined ash. I didn't want to avoid all the data. But look across. The numbers are pretty consistent. Austin, 4, 3.9, okay? Uh, Padman. 8.4, 8.9. Look down the table, mercury, what was it? 0 0.6, 0 0.5. 25 years of exposure, 25 years of weathering, and really no statistically significant change in the mean concentrations. That even surprised me because when we looked at the data from our leaching studies, that we from our bench skill work, we couldn't measure fluxes coming off. No doubt about it. And the fluxes were large enough that we should be seeing some change. But we didn't. Here's an idea of how aggressive some of these bench get tests are that we were asked to perform. And the same thing is pretty true when you look at the combined ash. Now, now, you can see a higher concentration in a combined ash as compared to the bottom ash. 
But that's because the iron is enriched in certain metals. But also, 11.6 on the outside, 13 on the inside. Cadmium, 24.8, 25. Whether it was the bottom ash or the combined ash, we really didn't see any leaching from the surface of these plots that have been exposed to the environment for you know, a quarter of a century. Of course, while your eye tells you one thing, statistics tell you, might tell you something else. So we did the standard you know, student t-test on the data. We took, I think, a relatively conservative approach, 95% confidence interval, one tail test. And when you statistically evaluate the data, for the bottom edge cores, just potassium and sodium, Potassium and sodium were the only two metals that had a statistically lower concentration on the outside of the block as compared to the inside. Not only surprising, they're both salts, kind of solid. Combined ash, a little surprising, was chromium and copper. Now, when I went back and I looked at the chromium and the combined ash, 38.4, 42.6. I might tell you, they're really pretty much the same. When you look at the individual data, the numbers are so tight that there's virtually no variance in the data sets, okay? So that's what that one pot got. Copper, no doubt about it. 568, 838. So in terms of conclusions in the block chemistry, there's a little doubt in my mind that the pollen cement stabilization is the ability to immobilize metals that are associated with MSW usable solid waste combustor ash. <coughs> Long-term exposure to the natural environmental conditions appears to have had no impact on stabilization. And then finally, we had to go back to look at that structural integrity. We doubling compressive strength in 25 years. See, that's, that's pretty atypical. Concrete products will get stronger as a function of time, but only for so long, okay, and then it stops. And there's no way you can explain from the excess hole and cement doubling the present strength. So you look at what else could ultimately lead to additional cementitious reactions inside that material. And when you look at what we call positronic reactions, cementitious reactions, the cast of characters that are necessary to drive these reactions are calcium, silica, iron, and aluminum. Go back and look at the ash, and those are four constituents that are found in major concentrations in the ash. Okay, there's no doubt in my mind that these materials, the kinetics are slow, but they're continually making additional cementitious bonds, and that's bringing up the compressor strength as well. Uh, let me go, okay, real quick. I had the opportunity to go to the facility, back to Westchester, where we collected the ash back in 1990 to make the boat house. And so I took samples today. To compare, how has ash changed between 1990 and present? Now, before we go into the numbers, a couple of differences, okay? Back in the 80s, the preferred protocol for digesting samples was to use hydrochloric acid, okay? But not today. Today, EPA protocols require nitric acid. And that's understandable. Nobody wants to put hydrochloric acid into their instruments any longer where you went through quite a bit of instrumentation using hydrochloric acid in the old days. But HF is a much more aggressive acid. And so you would get a little bit better digestion using that versus the nitrogen. The other big difference between today and 25 years ago is the instrumentation. Today's instrumentation, I mean, everybody uses ICP, state of the art. It wasn't even around when we did the boathouse. We had to use the atomic zone with respect to the commentary. I mean, that's like comparing a Lexus to a Model T, okay? So, so when you look at the data, you have to keep these differences in mind. Now, are you comparing apples to oranges? I, I don't think you're comparing apples to oranges here. There'll be some differences, but not that great. Maybe comparing oranges to tangerines, okay? Same family, but a little bit different. So here we go. Now, Here's uh, the mean of six analyses. Phone house data, we'll talk about how these get screwed up in time, but all I have for the boathouse are means. That's all I have. 
I had to take this from reports. So but let's look here. The only metal that's in much higher concentration today than back in the 1990s is calcium. Whether it's a bottom ash or combined ash, much more calcium in the ash today than there was 25 years ago. That's because today we have much stricter emission standards. So we need to use much more lime to keep those acid gases and other constituents from getting out of the environment. So that explains that. Look at where we see some really significant reduction in concentrations. Aluminum, iron, these metals are way down. Well, that's not surprising either. Today we have technology that pulls these metals out of the ash, but even before they get the ash, most communities have pretty good recycling programs. In the 1980s, that wasn't even around. And then look at some of the other constituents of concern. Arsenic is way down, uh, cadmium, cadmium is down. Many of the metals we find in lower concentration in the ash today than we did 25 years ago. That's because, number one, we have recycling programs, okay? That doesn't even get to the waste stream anymore. Uh, we put nickel cadmium batteries in our, in our cans, okay? We put metal, tin, and all that in our, in our cans for recycling. But also we've changed the chemistry of the product you purchase. I mean, anyone that's been in this business long enough, God knows, you've never tested air from a waste energy plant the first week of January. <laughs> Not in the 80s you didn't. It was all the Christmas wrappings, okay? <laughs> all that colorful Christmas wrappings, that was all metal dyes, okay? Today, of course, we use water soluble dyes. Print, print, new spring had a lot of lead in it. No longer today. Changes in product chemistry are being reflected in the composition of the ash we're seeing coming from these facilities. Okay, conclusions. Structure of the boat house is stronger today than it was the day we built it. There's no doubt about that. If we're a quarter century of weathering, we've not seen any changes in the composition of the ash blocks. And the combined ash blocks, while in rich new metals when compared to the bottom ash blocks, still retain their metals. Today's ash has a lower concentration of most metals than we saw back in the 1990s. There's two things I thought I'd pass on before we call this quits. And that's what I found as I prepared for this presentation, boy did I screw up, okay? I mean, I had file cabinets full of data on the boathouse, loaded with it. Come time today, to, or a couple weeks later to get this presentation ready, I, Went to look for it. <laughs> I don't have it anymore. Okay? I mean, clearly, as I moved from North Source, I guess I tossed it. Suggestion for you people starting out, just don't make the same mistake I especially today. I mean, today you can scan data. You can probably get a file cabinet worth of information on a zip drive or, or you know, uh, a zip drive, but a, uh, a memory stick. Okay? And I hold on to it. I, I never thought of needing this data, but I find out I really could have used it. I'm like Bob Al, given Bob Al is off, you know, he has everything, okay? But I don't, I did. Okay? And the other thing that really has, I really screwed up, technology has changed. I mean, when I started this, uh, you know, we had an IBM uh, 8086 PC, or had a five and a quarter floppy dish drive, or a foreign DOS 2.0, that was standing there. Well, I mean, yeah, I've got, I've got the, I've got the floppy disk, and I've got the three and a half inch and the, the zip drives. <laughs> I can't read any of it. Okay, <laughs> can't read any of it. I should have, if I was thinking correctly, I should have as platforms change as technology improve. I should have transferred my data. Back when we did the boat house, Microsoft Office did not exist. In fact, Lotus One Two Three wasn't around. I used to solve a package called Busy Disk. It was cheap, I could afford it, okay? But I should have made those conversions. I, can, I, I can't go back today, we tried. I can't go back today and open up those spreadsheets with the actual data for my work. Okay, finally, yeah. One valid test is worth a thousand expert opinions. I don't know who said that. I clearly did not. Okay? Now, I'll tell you, I grew up in Brooklyn. I don't come up with a, a good statement at all. Okay? 
someone much smarter than I said that. But when I was much more active here at the center doing research, I had a lab over, a couple labs, I'd have one lab over it and Challenger, and I actually had a sign with that statement on it that my students could see every day when I walked in, because I really believe that one valid test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And this study, I think, validates that statement. I think now we have the data. We have the data to go back to those thousand expert opinions about how these boxes are going to deteriorate, how alkalinity is going to be lost, and we're going to, you know, we're going to leach metals into the environment. We have something now that trumps those expert opinions. And that's good, sound, scientific data. And that will trump opinions on any day of the week. So finally, let's answer the question. How has the boathouse aged? And it's one thing I can assure you, it's aged better than I have. <laughs> OK, so I want to thank you for your time and attention. And First. <laughs> um, considering that this seems like such an excellent uh, recycling method for all this ash and stuff, has this been implemented in other locations besides uh, the boathouse? Okay. In Europe, it's used all the time. Europe and Asia, they use almost all the bottom ash. And a lot of it goes in poverty applications. Here in the States, we're, 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 we have a terrible bad character. We, our betting average here in the States is worse than the men. No, I can't say the men's yet. The Yankees. No, I can't say the Yankees either. Okay. By the way, we have, we have a terrible batting average. And there's a couple of reasons for it. I mean, again, we've been managing our rares just combined edge. Now, you know, well, the bottom edge has great characteristics for, for reuse. The blind fly edge brings nothing to the table. From an engineering perspective, it's terrible. Okay? It provides no strength, adds contamination, we have a problem. We're seeing a change taking place. A, a, a number of these plants now are beginning to separate the flower from the body. Now, I'd like to say they're doing that because they really want to be environmentally conscious and things like that, but that's not true at all. We find out, we find out that we can better remove metals from bottom ash and keep the fly out of the system. And metal recovery out of ash generates true income, real money. Okay, and that's why they're doing it. But now that we have that bottom ash and it's being processed, now we do have some potential. In the first state, Florida, about a year ago, gave the first series of permits to reuse the ash in highway applications. So we're making a small dent, but we have a long way to go. But yeah. Thanks very much. Um, maybe it's because you mentioned silver adversary. I looked at the silver concentration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They looked quite different. I was surprised it didn't show up uh, statistically. Yeah, uh, I think it was just because of the variability in the data that the, you know, the variance was, was high enough mm -hmm. that it did. Okay, uh, and you'll see some of those anomalies. Um, you can't deny it happens. Uh, yeah. Um, so you said that the especially the metal concentration has changed significantly now in the ash than 25 years ago. Do you have any sort of hypothesis as to how that would change the strength and structural integrity of ash blocks made out of the current chemical composition? Yeah. Um, in terms of structural integrity, those you know inorganic compounds really provide little. What we're looking at when when it comes to the strength of a something like a cement block or any type of compound, <coughs> it's more a function of the structure of the particle. You know brain size distribution and those physical geotechnical characteristics than it is of the um, of the chemistry. Okay. Um, yeah, Bob. Have all those pot marks affected the structural integrity or not the <sighs> Yeah, all those, if you go out to the boathouse, you'll see all these little pot marks in it. And, and, and that's due, those, those, those are due to our inability to pull metal out of the air back, back in the early days. Okay. Uh, so if you really look closely at those little pock marks in there, you'll notice either they're going to have a little rust stain in them, and that's where there was a piece of iron right beneath the surface. That iron oxidized, expanded, popped out. Or you're going to find a little white spot. And that little white spot's going to be due to aluminum. Today, we have the technology to, to dramatically improve that. I mean, the last thing these people want to do is put aluminum and iron and all these other metals into a landfill. Because on 
recycle market, they represent a good source of income. So today will be a lot of it. Has it affected the structural integrity? Well, these spots have sat outside too for 25 years. So pretty much, I'd like to think pretty much the same. Yeah? Um, if someone asked you to build a new roadhouse today, do you think that the results of this study would be able to outweigh all of the new expert opinions that exist in your time? Boy, I sure hope so. <laughs> okay, and I think so. I mean, I think you now we, we, we have something we did not have 25 years ago, and that's a good set of data, you know? When you go to these public forums and you try to explain to them how you've done these bench scale laboratory tests and you've modeled, you know, you've modeled the leaching and all that, and you can see as soon as you talk about projections and modeling, the majority of the audience starts to look, you know, what is he talking about, you know, and, and they're a little skeptical. But I think you come in, you, you know, people, people were willing to listen, but, but, you know, our critics kept hammering. How do you really know in 25 years after? How do you really know? You really don't know. You really don't know. You know? It's just a projection. It's, it's a hypothesis. It's speculation. And they played that card very successfully, quite honestly. But I think you go in and say, oh, no. we now have the data. You're quite a demerit. So what's going to happen if they convert South Campus to uh, graduate student housing? Get you, get to, you, get, you get to take all the nets that are in the boathouse home with you and put them in your basement. But are they going to tear it down? Oh, I would have, Mary, I don't think we've been around long enough to have to worry about that, okay? But, I mean, they may tear it down. How would I know? Okay, yes? Are there any organic byproducts to combustion that would be a concern? Sure, okay? When it comes to the bottom ash, we find virtually no organics in the bottom ash. It's, it's heated to such an extent, okay, that there's none. But if you remember, we, we see that grand tour that the flue gases take, and as those flue gases are making that grand tour, we have metals condensing on the particles. Well, you can also get organics. And the one organic, or the one family of organics that has always been problematic are dioxins and purines. Okay, you find that in the fluorine particle. And when we started this work in the 80s, okay, the concentration of these organic compounds in the fluorine was pretty high. Okay? And, and there were all sorts. There were all sorts of studies going on. Now, how, how can it be? These are organic compounds. The grate is at 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. How can these be? Raise the temperature of the grate. Raise the temperature of the grate. Boy, dioxins furant. Oh man. All right. <laughs> it took a group of German scientists to figure out what was going on. What happens is, as these flue gases make the grand tour, there's a very narrow window of opportunity for these constituents to form. Okay. So what we do now to mitigate the formation is we make sure those flue gases go into the scrubber at a temperature above which the oxygen to pure ants can form. Then we hit it with this slurry of lime to take out the acid gases. But when you hit it with that slurry of lime, you drop the temperature right away. And it's a temperature below which these compounds can't form. So it's a very, very narrow window of opportunity. We've now been able to reduce the oxygen fuel in these facilities by more than 99.9%. Okay, we've really done a great job. Now that we understand the inflammation. Uh, Dave. Okay, Frank. So, <laughs> ashes, ashes enriched in metal more than over sand. Yes. So, what's the end of life scenario for the for the boathouse? This boathouse here. Yep. Uh, we we yep. Okay, here we go again. We had to do health risk assessments prior to getting these permits. And we looked at that question, okay? What's going to be, what's going to be the fate? And the truth of the matter is that we could find no carcinogenic or non-carcinogenic risk above the threshold limit. From what I'm seeing, I mean, you know, you look at it, we don't much worry about when we tear up a road and the asphalt. And the asphalt can be much more problematic than these metals, okay? And I suspect the fate will be the same. It'll get torn up and it'll go into a landfill, ultimately like everything else does sooner or later. Yeah. So when you measured the rainwater coming out drain from the walls, you didn't find, it was clean, but okay. this, but when you look at the sodium, the sodium has disappeared. Where did it go? 
Well, it was potassium. Was it sodium potassium of a higher and a higher? Yeah. yeah. It must have just leached out and, and went into the soil. It just leached out to the side of the rock during the rainwater and went into the soil. So that word is it means the samples you're taking were not representative of the rain trickle. But it's an average over no. 25 years. Yeah, right. right. Okay. That's yeah. When we did, first of all, when we had a look at the, the percolation of rain on the side of the building, <laughs> we, the EPA, and we tried that and, and, and we just couldn't, we couldn't do it. Okay. Um, we were finding cross contamination, trying to cut it up the sides of the building. So what we actually did, we, we built test walls, okay, around the boat house uh, from excess blocks that we had. And we, we built them in a trough so that when it rained, the water would get into this trough that we could keep clean. It was made out of uh, lucite. And we could collect the rainwater without any contamination. And, you know, I'd have to go back to the data. We might have seen some sodium. Truthfully, what we looked at, what we really looked at were drinking water standards. And sodium's not in the drinking water standard. We just looked at the metals as, you know, the, 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 the function of the primary drinking water standards. And in that case, we didn't see anything coming off. So we probably have to stop here. We can't stop yet. Why? Because not only is today the 25th anniversary of the Bowen House, <laughs> but it's also Kim's birthday. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh. I just like to say a couple of things. First of all, the Bowen House is the most beautiful building on South Kim. <laughs> <laughs> but the second is that the university didn't even acknowledge its existence. It took 10 years to put it on a map. And they wouldn't, they refused to paint it for another, for a decade. Oh, easy. So uh, that contributed to uh, some of the deterioration on the outside of the block because you're really supposed to paint cinder block or ash block almost immediately. So anyway, thank you so much. For okay.